Frock Liebs, a 21-year-old, remained unseen since June 2006. Despite her absence, she consistently reassured her boyfriend and family through periodic messages or calls that she was fine, and there was no cause for concern. However, three months later, the discovery of Frock's lifeless body initiated an inquiry into one of the most enigmatic murders in 21st century Germany. Future Nurse Born in 1985, Frock Liebs pursued her dream of helping people by enrolling in nursing school after graduating from high school, set to complete her studies in 2007. Eager to commence her career, she had always envisioned making a positive impact on others. In 26, the 21-year-old resided in Paderborn with her boyfriend, Chris. While they had experienced frequent disagreements and even temporarily parted ways, their relationship had improved by the onset of summer. Described by friends and family as a serene and compassionate individual, Frock not only dedicated herself to the field of medicine, but also enjoyed activities such as fitness, embroidery, and had a passion for biathlon. Maintaining a healthy lifestyle, she was known for her calm demeanor and kindness, never finding herself in troublesome situations. The Pub On the morning of June 20, 26, Frock followed her routine, attending classes and completing lectures and practical sessions until approximately 3 p.m. after a brief return home to prepare for dinner with Chris and her mother, Ingrid, at a restaurant, Frock appeared disinterested during the meal. Feeling a shift in the evening's energy, Frock welcomed a text message from her friend Isabella, inviting her to a pub to watch a World Cup soccer match between England and Sweden with friends. Eager for a change, she agreed promptly. Around 7 p.m., Frock, Ingrid, and Chris left the restaurant and went their separate ways. However, upon realizing he had forgotten his keys, Chris retraced his steps to the pub, where he retrieved them from Frock. Little did he know that this would be the last time he saw his girlfriend alive. Home The company was engrossed in the sporting event, but Frock displayed little interest in the on-field action. Instead, she was actively engaged in texting, to the point where the battery of her Nokia push-button phone depleted. Seeking a solution, she requested Isabella to lend her the battery of her phone, enabling Frock to resume her intense communication. Following the conclusion of the match at 11.00 p.m. with plans for the group to continue their festivities at the pub, Frock declined the invitation. Handing back the borrowed battery to her friend, she declared her intention to head home. With a mere five euros in her pocket, and a distance of approximately one five kilometers to the apartment she shared with Chris, it is presumed that Frock opted to walk. The events that transpired after she left the bar remain unknown, as she was never seen again. Disappearance After midnight, Chris grew concerned about Frock's whereabouts as her phone was switched off, and she remained missing. At 12.49 a.m., a message arrived from Frock's number. I'll be back a little later, don't worry about me. Perceiving nothing unusual in the text, Chris went to bed. The following morning, Isabella, worried about Frock's absence from class, contacted Chris, prompting him to call Ingrid Frock's mother. When it became apparent that Frock was nowhere to be found, Chris turned to the police to file a missing persons report. Regrettably, the police declined to take immediate action, asserting that Frock, being of age, had the freedom to make her own choices about her whereabouts. They deemed it premature to initiate a search at that point. Over the next two days, the police limited their efforts to checking hospitals and morgues for any signs of Frock, dismissing the need for a search. Meanwhile, her family and friends took matters into their own hands, 
distributing flyers throughout Paderborn in their quest to find her. Hi, Chris. When the police finally intervened on June 22, they discovered that Frock had somehow ended up outside the city after leaving the pub. The message sent to Chris at 12.49 a.m. revealed that her phone was located in Neheim, 33 kilometers away from Paderborn. This information suggested that Frock may have hitched a ride with someone, leading her to Neheim. While the police investigation followed this trail, the mystery surrounding Frock's disappearance lingered, inviting speculation reminiscent of scenarios from the popular series. However, those intriguing details will be explored at another time. Later in the evening of the same day, when the police initiated their search for the missing girl, Chris received an unexpected phone call from Frock. While he was certain it was her voice, it sounded somewhat peculiar, carrying a hint of anger. Hey Chris, I want you to know I'm fine and I'll be home soon. Tell that to mom, dad, and the others, Frock conveyed before abruptly ending the call. I can't tell. Unable to provide further details, Chris informed Frock's family. They gathered at his home, anticipating her return. However, Frock never appeared, and all attempts to contact her proved futile as her cell phone was once again switched off. It would later be revealed that she was merely a kilometer away from home in Paderborn. The mystery persisted, what or who prevented her from returning? The following day, on June 23, at 2306, Frock reached out again, this time calling her brother Frank. Her voice conveyed complete calmness, even a touch of indifference. Frock, what are you doing when you get home? Frank inquired. I will come home today, but later. I'm in Paderborn. Please don't ask me for details, Frock responded. Where are you? Frank pressed. I can't tell you. Their conversation concluded, and moments later, Chris received a message from Frock. I'm coming home today. I'm in Paderborn. I love you. At this point, the police ceased their search, convinced that Frock's absence was of her own volition. I'm in Paderborn. On June 24 at 2.20 p.m., Frock called Chris once again, reiterating her intention to return home today. The conversation was brief and unusual. Do you need any help? Chris inquired. No, Frock replied, emphasizing, I'm in Paderborn, I'm in Paderborn, I'm in Paderborn. The repetition of I'm in Paderborn three times marked a peculiar moment, prompting scrutiny as it might not be a mere coincidence. On June 25 at 10.28 p.m., Frock made another call. The conversation mirrored previous ones, with one notable difference. When questioned about her delayed return, she assured Chris that she would provide a detailed explanation upon her return. Last Call On Tuesday, June 27, Frock's parents and her sister joined Chris for the evening, anticipating another call from Frock around her usual time, approximately 11 p.m. As expected, the call came at 11.24 p.m. and Chris answered, putting it on speaker for everyone to hear. Frock, hi Chris, I'm fine. Chris, where are you? Frock, I can't tell you. Chris, come back home. Frock, no I can't. Chris, why not? Frock, I can't tell you. Chris, are you locked out? Frock, yes, no, no. Chris, are you afraid? Frock, no. Chris, who's with you? Frock, I can't tell you. Chris, are you tired? Frock, yes, very tired. Chris, do you know the police are looking for you? Frock, yes, I know. Chris, how come? Frock, I've been away for a week. Chris, why aren't you coming back? Frock, 
You know, Chris. Chris, did you get a new boyfriend? Frock, you know I wouldn't be gone this long for a boyfriend? You know me. Chris, why didn't you come back even though you said you would? Frock, I'll tell you later. Chris, are you afraid to go home? Frock, no. Chris, are you with one person or several? Frock, please don't ask me that. I would like to be with you. I'd like to go home, but I can't yet. Chris, can I pick you up from somewhere? Frock, no, you can't. Chris, can't we meet somewhere? Frock, no, you can't. It's not possible. Chris, where are you? Frock, mom. Chris, where are you? Frock, mom. Chris, where are you? Frock, mom. Chris, when will you be in touch again? Frock, I don't know. Chris, call me at least once a day. Frock, I'm doing that. Chris, but you didn't call yesterday. I miss you. Frock, yes, I know you're sad. We'll talk soon. Bye. After those words, the connection dropped, marking the last time Frock's phone was active. Frock never contacted Chris or anyone else again. Mom? This conversation struck everyone as exceptionally peculiar. Those who listened to it couldn't shake the impression that Frock seemed disoriented, possibly influenced by substances or mechanically reciting from a script. Her speech resembled that of an automaton with an empty, emotionless voice. The repetition of mommy three times in response to the question of her location added to the mystique. Was Frock attempting to convey something through this repetition, similar to her earlier threefold repetition of I'm in Paderborn? Was there a connection between these instances? Despite the halt in Frock's calls, the police, convinced she had voluntarily left home, discontinued their search. Chris and the girl's family, unsuccessful in their independent efforts, enlisted the help of a private investigator in July. Unfortunately, this too yielded no results. Finding On the evening of October 4, 2006, a mushroom hunter exploring a wooded area near Route 817, approximately 30 kilometers from Paderborn, stumbled upon the remains of Frock Leibs. Her identity could only be ascertained through DNA analysis. Frock was discovered clad in the same attire she wore on the day of her disappearance, indicating that she likely passed away shortly after her last recorded call, approximately three months prior. Due to this time lapse, the coroner's office was unable to determine the cause of death. No traces of illicit substances or alcohol were detected either, but the extended period may have led to their natural dissipation. Significantly, her cell phone, purse, watch, and wallet were never recovered. Consequently, law enforcement concluded that the sequence of events involved a murder followed by a robbery. Suspects it was only at this point that authorities began to intensify their efforts in the Frock Liebs case. Despite numerous clues discovered at the crime scene, the interrogation of 900 individuals, and the search of 40 residences, no substantial leads emerged. For a prolonged period of 10 years, the case remained stagnant. In 2016, the wage and espouses were apprehended in Bossyborn, located 50 kilometers from Paderborn. They were found to have held a woman captive in their basement for several weeks, and indications suggested that she was not their sole victim. This prompted the police to initially suspect the couple's involvement in Frock's death. However, a few months later, an official police statement conveyed that no evidence had been uncovered linking the Wageners to Frock's disappearance or demise. Frock Lieb's murder remains unsolved, leaving a myriad of unanswered questions that have confounded law enforcement. Why did Frock reach out to her boyfriend and family, 
but avoid answering most of their inquiries. Why was she not cited after leaving the pub, especially considering her frequent movements around Paderborn? Where was she during the period between June 20 and June 27? Do her cryptic responses conceal hidden clues? And most crucially, who killed Frock Liebs and for what reason? I hope you like this story. Please don't forget to leave a comment sharing with your thoughts below. Give a thumbs up this video and remember to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more captivating stories. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey and we'll see you in the next video.